Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Going to get into another round of questions this evening. I want you to always remember in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And it says, he who, he who warreth, meaning we war against the, not flesh and blood, but against principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places, like you see in Ephesians chapter 6. So it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he that warreth doesn't get entangled in the affairs of this life, so that you can be pleasing to him who chose you to be a soldier. And of course, that's Almighty God. And not getting entangled in the affairs of this life, that doesn't mean you can't have hobbies, that doesn't mean you can't enjoy life, but you stay away from the wicked things. You stay away from things that would keep you from serving God. You stay away from things that would pull you down. And you always put God number one in your life. And it also says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, you strive for the mastery lawfully, meaning you strive for the prize and you do it God's way. And the ultimate prize is, of course, eternal life. And then you know what it says? It says, if you do these things, the Lord will give you understanding in all things. But if you're not doing your best, and of course we all fall short at times, we all sin, we all make mistakes, but when you do repent and your sins are erased, but if you're not even trying to do what's right, if you're not trying your best to serve God and study His Word and stay away from things that are not the right way, if you're not even trying to do those things, why would you expect God to give you understanding of His Word? So you remember that. Always study to show yourself approved, which it also says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, matter of fact. So let's get into these questions. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. All right, first question. We have Mindy. We don't know where Mindy's from. How many times a year are we to take communion? Three, question mark. Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles, question mark. I want to be sure not to mislead anyone on my social page. Thank you. And you can take communion anytime you want, anytime you feel led of the Lord. There is no set number or anything like that. And remember uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. It says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now, of course, that there's nothing wrong with taking communion on the things that you mentioned, but it's not like that's a set requirement that you have to do that. You do what you feel led to do by Almighty God. And I'm also going to mention um, where we are taught, and with, there's multiple places, but 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 26, we're taught about communion. Those verses say, And when he had given thanks... He broke it, meaning Christ broke the bread, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He comes. You, it's a memorial to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when you take communion, reminding us of the blood that He shed and that His body was broken on the cross. But you can do it any time you feel led to do it of the Lord. Melissa, we don't know where Melissa's from. The locust army specified in Revelation chapter 9, I thought reflected Joel chapter 2, an army set by God, 200 million. And Revelation chapter 9 and Joel chapter 2 absolutely is the same army, that locust army. And it does give that number, 200 million in Revelation chapter 9. It says um, 200,000, 
but it just simply means a, a number that you can't even count. And then you continue, are they flesh? Absolutely not. They are wicked angels, um, evil spirits, fallen angels. And you read, we, we dove just about as deep as we ever have before into Revelation chapter 9 on our study we did this past Sunday called Kings and Priests Imitation. And where they come from, they come from the abyss, the bottomless pit. And then so you continue. And if there is a connection between Revelation chapter 9 and Joel chapter 2, when God claims he sent them, are they good or are they bad? Meaning, are they pretending to be bad, or are they really bad? They are the most, they are wicked, wicked beings, and they are pretending to be good. They're not pretending to be bad. They are truly evil, but they are pretending to be good. They're pretending to be kings and priests of Almighty God. Remember, the fallen angels, wicked angels, and wicked spirits, and fallen angels. And I'm going to read a couple of things here. Joel chapter 1 verse 6, it describes him without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. And um, so, and that will remind you of Revelation 9. And the, the lies that comes out of their mouth just is going to, it destroys spiritually. And, uh, rem, and understand, God gives us symbology. What does an actual locust do? They just strip every green thing. I mean, absolutely destroy and strip everything bare that they come in contact with, leaves and so forth. But you see in Revelation chapter 9, those, the, this locust army, they, they don't hurt the green things because they're coming to destroy spiritually with the incredible deception they will bring. And like you mentioned, God calls them my great army in Joel chapter 2 verse 25. God's in control. He's the one that's sending them to see who studied God's word and who has not. But so that shows you, you don't have anything to worry about whatsoever. God's on the throne. He's in control. Also, Joel chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Why? Because they're not flesh. I also want to mention 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 15. It says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That word transformed can even mean disguised. And then it says, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So they are wicked, wicked entities, but they will be claiming to be ministers of God, claiming to bring you to Christ. But who they are leading you to is the false Christ. When Satan's here on earth disguised as Christ, claiming to be Christ. You know from Daniel chapter 8 verse 25 that Satan by peace shall destroy many when he arrives as the false Christ. And um, I think that just about gets it said. And don't ever, and like I said, that study we did, kings and priests and imitation, will go into much more detail Never forget also Mark chapter 13, verse 20. You find out Satan's deception as the false Christ is so incredible. If God did not shorten the time for the elect's sake, then even the elect would be deceived. So, and we went into, and I'll just, I'm not even going to go any further, but you can go further in that study, kings and priests, if you want, but it's all about deception, so be ready for it. That, of course, happens before we're gathered together to Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Carol, we don't know where Carol's from. Why do you think some folks believe we are already in the millennium? I know that we're not simply because we are in the, our flesh bodies. And anyone that would say that, they just have no idea what the millennium even is at all. The millennium is that thousand-year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. It begins after Jesus Christ returns to earth. And when Jesus Christ returns, when that seventh trumpet sounds and it's time for Christ to return, everyone is changed into a spiritual body. So you know if you're still in the flesh that Christ has not returned. But you see, when everyone is changed into a spiritual body, that means there's no more handicap, physical or mental. There's no more sickness. There's no more disease. So is that happening right now? Of course not. 
I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all that someone would say that. And Satan's locked in the pit for the thousand years with no influence at all. So does Satan, does Satan have influence now on in the world? Look around. You bet he does. And then, not only that, but you, when during the thousand years, everyone will see Jesus Christ in person. He will be with us. So I can't, I don't, I can't understand why anyone would say that, but... Like I said, they just don't, anyone, they don't understand what the millennium even is, if they would say that. And those who did not pass the test while they were in the flesh, they will be taught during that thousand years. And God's elect will be priests, and they will reign with Jesus Christ through that thousand year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. Tammy from Virginia. Why did Melchizedek come? Maybe the bread and wine he... Sh Maybe the bread and wine he shared was to show that he would die on the cross so we could have communion with him until Yeshua comes and that the next supper on the Lord's Day we would have supper with him. Jesus was Melchizedek. And it's true that Jesus Christ is Melchizedek. And in Genesis chapter 14, Melchizedek brought the bread and the wine. Yes, that's symbolic of Christ's body and his blood that he shed and that was broken on the cross for us. But there's a great deal more to why Melchizedek came. And it's really spelled out for you in Hebrew chapter 7. We're also going to read about Melchizedek in Psalm chapter 110. We're almost there in the book of Psalms. But in uh, Hebrew chapter 7, Melchizedek, it says, He has no beginning, no end, no mother, nor father, made like unto the Son of God. So once again, it, it of course is the Son of God. It is Christ. It's God Himself. Melchizedek. Melchizedek means the king of righteousness. He's also called the king of Salem, which means king of priests, or uh, king of peace, sorry. And there's only one. And so now let's get into it a little bit on, you said, why did Melchizedek come? You see in Hebrews chapter 7, it, it mentions to you what happened in Genesis 14, how even uh, Abraham even paid tithes to Melchizedek. And then it goes on to say that, well, the Levitical priesthood take tithes, but then it mentions how um, Levi was even in the loins of Abraham. Levi hadn't even been born yet. So it lets you know that even Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek. So the point is the, priest of, the priesthood of Melchizedek is much higher and much, much greater even than, than the Levitical priesthood. And you see, the, it says in Hebrews chapter 7, it says, um, uh, let me get to where it is here. Okay, it says, this is me quoting Hebrews chapter 7. It says, If perfection were by the, the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So, so there was, there was the, the Levitical priesthood was not perfect. The law, no one can be saved by the law. That's what it really, really comes down to. So there needed to be a higher priesthood that can bring salvation. And that is the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. And, and that's what it says about Jesus Christ. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Because Jesus Christ brings salvation. Because we all sin, we all fall short, so you can't be saved by the law. Are we still supposed to follow the morals of the law? Of course. But you can't be saved by it because we all fall short. But you are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. When you do accept Him as your Savior and you believe in Jesus Christ, you do receive that eternal life. Remember John chapter 3, verse 16 and it talks about how in Hebrews chapter 7, Jesus Christ did not have an earthly father who was of the Levitical priesthood. Well, why is that? Because he did not have an earthly father at all. Because God our Father is his father, and he was born of Mary a virgin. So, no, Christ was not called after the order of the Levitical priesthood, not called after the order of man. He was called after the order of Melchizedek. And Jesus Christ is king of kings, priests of priests, and the only way to salvation is to believe in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Scott, we don't know where Scott's from. I have a question on Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, where it says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, 
so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What is your interpretation of Jesus being in the heart of the earth for three days? I believe that some people are misled by this verse as I don't know the meaning. And of course he's saying they're misled because they don't understand, not that the verse is misleading. And then you continue, um, was, try, was trying to plant a seed and they believe that this is where Jesus went when he died after the cross. But she called it to the center of the earth or hell. But we know he, Jesus, went, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, going to the left side of the gulf all the way back to the time of Noah. And so, first of all, I want to say there's no such thing as my interpretation. There's only one interpretation, and it's God's interpretation. And the Bible proves itself. So you're never going to hear me say, oh, this is my interpretation. We, there's only one interpretation, and it's the interpretation of God and His Word. So anyway, um, so Christ, just as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days, Christ's flesh body was in the tomb for three days. But of course, his, you did mention, even though his flesh was in the tomb, his actual self, his spirit, uh, Christ went to preach to the spirits in prison. As you mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19, and um, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 6, I'll mention also, it says, For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to man in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. And then I'll also mention uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, where it says, Wherefore he saith, when he, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men, such as salvation. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? And he did went and he preached to those spirits in prison. God is always fair. He gives everyone ample opportunity. And how fantastic that truly is. Eric, we don't know where Eric's from. I think a good part of Revelation already occurred. Satan was in the Garden of Eden as an adversary. This indicates he had already fallen. Revelation ch chapter 12 of Revelation describes this. And that is definitely, um, so you make an excellent point, first of all, where you say Satan obviously already fell before the Garden of Eden. He was already the adversary. You're, that's a fantastic point. You're absolutely right about that. But it would be a, absolutely not a true statement to say that a, great, a good part of Revelation already occurred. And what so many people are just, they, they, ha, they don't have it in their equation, so they don't understand. They are not aware of the first earth age, of the world that then was. And the, world, the first earth age is mentioned in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 through 5 has already happened. It speaks about the first earth age. It speaks about Satan's original rebellion. And then it also even brings you even to this earth age where it even speaks of the birth of Jesus Christ and even all the way going to his crucifixion and resurrection. So, of course, those things already happened. But basically, the entire rest of the book of Revelation, basically, is all future. And a, a big mistake that many people make, that they read Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9 where it says Satan and his angels are cast out onto this earth. And what many people think is that that was what happened at Satan's original rebellion. Well, that is not the case at all. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, is talking about when Satan is cast out onto earth as the false Christ, and the fallen angels are coming with him. That, of course, has not happened yet. And in a perfect place that I'll mention is Job chapter 1, verse 6. Of course, that's way after the Garden of Eden. What do you see in Job chapter 1, verse 6? Satan's in heaven going before the throne of God to talk to God. And the sons of God, some angels are coming with him. So I know a lot of people think that when Satan originally rebelled, he was just cast out of heaven and, and he just never went back to heaven. Well, that's not true. And so I, I, ha I hope that I made that perfectly clear. But Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, that's future. 
when Satan is cast out on earth as the false Christ and the fallen angels are coming with him. And you read in Daniel chapter 10 about how even, even in Daniel's time and even today, there's fighting in heaven even between good angels and bad angels. So that's how it is today, but that's not how it's going to be for all eternity, praise God. But So I hope I answered that. Um, to, I hope I answered your question there. We don't know this person's name. What is the white stone of Revelation chapter 2, verse 17? And I have the verse written here. I'll read it. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So that white stone is a reward for God's elect who stand against the false Christ, who overcome. And that word um, stone, that Greek word is only used in one other place. It's translated as voice in Acts chapter 26, verse 10. And um, also, that, so that word stone, uh, that exact word is saphos, but it's very, very similar to the word phasizo uh, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. In fact, one of the words just comes from the other. And it's translated as count in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. I'm also briefly going to mention that exact Greek word is only used in one other place. And it's Luke chapter 14, verse 28, where it's translated as counteth. But so, what does it say in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18? It says, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Uh, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. That's 666. So, in order to overcome, to stand against the false Christ, you have to know who he is. The beast, the Antichrist, you have to know who he is. And like it says, it's the number of a man. So it's not some monster or anything like that. So who is it? It is Satan himself. It's not a flesh man. I know a lot of people get tripped up because they read that and they say, oh, well, that means it's a flesh man. No, because you even see in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 16, Satan's called a man there. They see him in the pit and they say, is this the man that shook kingdoms? So, Satan is a man, but he's not a flesh man. He is a beautiful, supernatural angel. He, in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13, it says he's full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And he's going to arrive as the beast, as the antichrist, as the false Christ. So, you have to know who he is in order to stand against him. And those of you that stand against him and you allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, you will receive that white stone when you overcome. I also want to mention where it's speaking about that white stone is speaking about the church of Pergamos there. Pergamos is written of in about Revelation chapter 2, verses about 12 through 17. And I wanted to mention how in Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, it mentions Satan's seat. And so that lets you know whose seat it's talking about in Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, and Revelation chapter 16, verse 10. It's Satan's seat. And that seat in the Greek is thronos, and it means a throne. So you have to know whose seat that is, and it is Satan's. We just mentioned in a previous question, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, how Satan's getting cast out onto this earth. Well, he's not getting cast out to watch some guy get worshipped. Satan himself wants to be worshipped. That's what he's wanted ever since the first earth age when he originally rebelled. And he's going to get the opportunity to try to convince the entire world that he is God. And everyone except for the elect will be deceived. When were the elect chosen? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, before the foundation of the world. They were chosen in the first earth age when they stood against Satan at his original rebellion. So God knows he can trust them to stand against him when he arrives as the false Christ. That is your destiny as God's elect. You read about in Mark 13, when you're delivered up to stand against Satan, it says, don't even premeditate what you will say. For it's not ye that speaks with the Holy Spirit that speaks through you. That is your destiny. 
Steve, uh, last question, Stephen, we don't know where Stephen's from. Where is the scripture that says we can go directly to God the Father for forgiveness and repentance? And I'll mention uh, about three or four scriptures here. First of all, um, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching us how to pray. And you learn there that you pray to the Father. And it says there, um, it says, um, it's teaching you how to pray. And it says one thing to say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So you ask the Father for forgiveness of your sins. Also, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. So there is not some man mediator between you and God. In Mark chapter 15, verse 38, it speaks, this is speaking of when Jesus Christ died on the cross. When his flesh body died, he gave up the spirit. It says, And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. That, so what is that veil? In the temple, it separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And you see, so that veil, only the high priest could go behind that veil. And he could only even do it one time a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement that you read about in Leviticus chapter 16. So you see, before Christ paid on the cross, they did have to have a man mediator between them and God. And that mediator was the high priest. But when Christ paid the price on the cross, he rent that veil from top to bottom. So you don't have some man in between you and God anymore. Christ rent the veil. And that's, once again, Hebrews chapter 7. Remember, that Levitical priesthood was not perfect. But, the, but now you find out that Jesus Christ is our high priest. The perfect high priest who is high priest forever. The high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That is the perfect priesthood to where now there is no, there is no man mediator between you and God anymore. The only mediator is Jesus Christ. And like you see in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Now we can come boldly to the throne of grace. You just go straight to the Father in prayer. You ask for forgiveness. And it's Almighty God that forgives sins. And it mentions there the, the grace and the mercy in that Hebrews chapter 4. So you go, to the, you go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, ask for forgiveness, and when you sincerely repent, your sins are erased like they never even existed. You see it in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. And I'll mention in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25, God says, I, I am He, meaning He's the one that does it. I, I am He that blotteth out thy sins for mine, for, blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will no more remember your sins. So it's the Father that forgives sins, our Heavenly Father, Yahweh. You remember Mark chapter 7, verse 13. Traditions of men make the Word of God of none effect. You stick to the Word of Almighty God. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. We thank you for all these amazing blessings you give us. In this place you've given us, we can teach your Word. We just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share them with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. at Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.